All right, everybody, uh, 1201 here, let's uh, get started. Um, my name is uh, Jim O'Donnell. There's my contact information on the lower left-hand screen. Uh, thank you all for attending uh, this webinar, plus all the ones we've had in the past. Um, today, I'm going to, uh, for my one-hour presentation, the world according to uh, Jim, regarding uh, designing one or single pipe systems. Um, I thought these systems might be making sort of a uh, potentially a comeback just with the upcoming uh, change that appears to be happening for uh, 410A refrigerant. Um, now it's changing to uh, uh, one that uh, is mildly flammable. Uh, I think it's going to be uh, difficult to do uh, VRF systems and split systems, et cetera, like that. So anyway, I wanted to talk about this topic. Uh, a lot of this is probably review from uh, other vendors or other systems when it has been around for a while. All right, so um, just uh, all the, all the uh, participants are muted. Uh, we'll be monitoring the questions. We'll try to keep them at the end. Uh, if something is pressing, then I will interrupt and answer it. Um, you know, just thank you to Gianna Salvatore for helping me uh, put this together. Um, we do have PDHs available, so please let, let me or Gianna know if you require those. And then uh, as you log off or when you log off, there is a survey. We do appreciate uh, if you can answer just a couple quick questions. Uh, helps us focus on do we do a good job explaining things, uh, what, um, you know, any other questions you might have, any other systems or, or items, as well as potential future topics. So anyways, let's get started. Um, so. Um, uh, agenda today, uh, just review single pipe systems. I'm considering them to be hydronic, which is chilled water and hot water. Uh, in addition, these systems can be applied to water source heat pumps, and that is obviously condenser water. Uh, a bunch of different design considerations just to go over. And then lastly, what we always try to do is what's new with HCNI, um, and as well as just quickly touch on what uh, systems we have available uh, to support uh, this design, support your projects. All right, so starting off, just a traditional hydronic two-pipe system. This has uh, multiple uh, terminal units in the upper right-hand corner. These typically have one coil. There is one main supply pipe and there's one main return pipe. We have a single system pump. You know, this could obviously be uh, main and standby for two. And then we either have, you know, in this site, uh, system here shown below in the lower left, we'd have a boiler used for heating in the wintertime and a chiller used for cooling in the uh, summertime. And obviously, um, you know, if you had just a heating system, there would be just a boiler, or if you had uh, uh, chilled water with electric heat, et cetera, like that, you would just have a chiller. Uh, that's a two pipe system. Once again, review a uh, four pipe system where uh, you have that same terminal unit that terminal unit, instead of having one coil, has two. You have two different uh, piping mains, piping systems. One is chilled water, the other is hot water. And then each of those pipes, each of those systems have a supply and return. Um, you know, uh, once again, you have two individual pumps for each of the systems. There could be, uh, you know, second pump uh, for each one as a main and backup. Um, so uh, common with uh, hydronic systems is a direct or reverse return, whether this is a two pipe or four pipe. The top slide, part of the slide here shows a direct return. The water comes down your supply pipe and then goes through unit number one and then back out to the return. And then out this way uh, for feed number two, you have uh, the water come down to number two and then back to the return pipe. As you can see, as we go down the line here, the units number five has a much longer uh, pipe length to travel uh, versus the closer ones. So you do require balancing valves at each of the units to try to choke down the flow at the uh, beginning of the line and open up the flow at the end of the line. Uh, 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 a different type of piping system would be reverse return where you would have the water come from the supply to the first unit. You then would go to your return main your water then would travel down and pick up the other lines. And then once it's all accumulated, it then comes back. What happens in the reverse return 
is that the the water length for number one uh, versus number five is is typically very uh, close in terms of the uh, the water pressure drops. I've seen you know some instances where they question is a balancing valve even required because everything is uh, you know equal uh, water pressure drop, but I would not recommend to do that. And then obviously the reverse return with the uh, longer pipe runs has um, a higher first cost, but then the other part is that it's typically easier to balance. The, co the, the coil uh, hookup for the uh, two and pipe, four pipe systems, this is just a typical one that I grabbed from carrier. You have on your supply and return, you have shutoff valves for isolation, uh, control valve to modulate your water flow, whether it's a two-way or three-way. Uh, balancing valve is used um, as the name describes. You uh, set it uh, you know, to adjust the amount of water that's feeding this coil. And then at the coil connection, uh, a lot of times these ones are kind of optional, but whether you have a flange or a union, if you have to remove the pipe uh, quickly, piece plugs are, are a, a port that can be used for pressure or, thermo or temperature. Uh, and then also a lot of times at the low point, you'll have a drain valve. Question here, whether you have a strainer or a uh, air vent also added to your system. So now on a single pipe system, what we've done is we still have our same terminal units. These terminal units will have, um, you know, one coil in them. Um, the uh, what we have done is we've come. We have a single pipe main that serves as your supply and return. And this pipe main remains the same as it travels throughout. We'll have a system pump. You know, once again, this could be uh, one or main with standby. And then uh, with the uh, the the utility. You could either have a situation here, like where you have the uh, similar to the other two pipe, where you have a boiler for heating and a, a chiller for cooling. All right, so that's a single pipe uh, system. Now, what ends up happening um, is the uh, the, the um, you have a different coil hookup, and then just once again mentioned before, this system is you know kind of old or uh, has been done before with heating. They would use like mono uh, mono fittings at each of the terminal units. So the coil piping detail for a single pipe system is different than for a two or four pipe. What we've done here is you have your uh, main piping and then your branch or uh, runout piping is another term for it. What we've uh, added is a small circulating pump. We're removing the control valve. We're removing the, removing the balancing valve. Uh, other items that remain the same from your two pipe system is your shutoff valves uh, as they are shown uh, near the coil uh, right here. Uh, a, a drain, uh, vent, uh, unions, et cetera, like that. Uh, nothing, these, these items here essentially stay the same as what you would have for a two or four pipe system. The benefits of a single pipe system, uh, what's the main benefit is that because you're not running that second main, that second main requires uh, fittings and, and turn down uh, for smaller sizes, insulation, et cetera, like that. You're saving a lot on your first cost. You'll end up with the same uh, heating and cooling performance at your at your uh, spaces versus a two or four pipe. It's easier to balance, and then uh, as I'll show you, you're able to downsize your main uh, circulating pump. And these systems do save a little bit of energy versus other two and four pipe systems. All right, where these units, where these systems can be used on chill beams, water source heat pumps, as well as fan coils. Uh, the fan coil picture is one that I took at the factory that shows the uh, isolation valves with the green handles and the two little blue circulating pumps. Uh, with these systems for the fluid temperatures, what you'll typically have is, uh, you know, the chill water is shown here, hot water is kind of similar, but essentially your water is leaving your chiller as it comes to the first um, uh, fan coil unit in this case, we'll have 42 degree water entering into the coil. It's picking up the heat from the system, uh, from your air, depositing it into the coil, into your chill water system. You'll then have this 50 degree water, uh, you know, a little bit of water mixing with a greater to a flow of 42 degrees. And so you end up at the next fan coil having a mixed air temperature from these two with 44. And then as you travel down the line, the last one in this loop, in this example here, had a, a 46 degree entering water temperature and then a 52. This 52 would mix with the, the 46 and then come out with a, a leaving water temperature or return water temperature of approximately 48 degrees. So that's typical of, of the uh, single pipe system. You do have mixing 
of your water temperatures from the supply and return of your terminal units. Pumping responsibilities. So you'll have your main pump uh, where uh, you're, you're taking care of this loop here. The main pump is uh, taking care of the, um, you know, the main piping, not the terminal units. What typically happens is that you have a lower water pressure drop because you're not having to account for the pressure losses through the um, you know, terminal units, so therefore a smaller uh, horsepower. And then at your uh, uh, terminal units, you'll have a circulator pump. This is going to and from the uh, terminal unit only. Typically, these are very small. They all also have a very long service life. Very little maintenance is done on that required of them. And then once again, just realize that the pump is only running uh, when the terminal unit uh, is on. And there's a picture of a uh, of a small little uh, circulating pump shown there on the uh, on the right. All right, next, just with water source heat pumps, as we're familiar, water source heat pumps are using water. This slide here just shows a typical system arrangement where you have uh, you know uh, multiple units, all these different types on the upper right. You have a boiler and a cooling tower or uh, to add or remove heat from your loop. And then just uh, your piping system uh, is feeding your, um, uh, you know, your, your water source heat pumps. So typically what is done is a two pipe system where you have a separate supply and return main. When you switch this to a one pipe, a single pipe system, you have one piping loop that goes around and similar to what I've shown you just before with the chill water, you'll end up mixing your supply and return water temperatures. So on the two pipe system, you have control valves at each of the terminal units with water source heat pumps, but then a single pipe system, once again, similar to what I've shown you before, you'll have a small little circulating pump. All right, next, the brunt of the uh, presentation that I wanted to go over is just design considerations. When uh, for a single pipe system, we'll talk about sizing the main and the branches. We'll give you some examples of routing, and then we'll just go over the different um, you know requirements or different things to watch out for with your uh, different water systems. The one thing I want to point out that's critical is that with chill water systems, whether it's DX or chill water, you always have to be cognizant to provide dehumidification control um, of your spaces. All right, so first let's talk about uh, pipe sizes uh, where you have uh, velocity or water pressure drop uh, versus your uh, velocity ver uh, as well as delta T. Just as I mentioned before, the main piping loop, because we're handling the entire flow of water, this pipe size remains the same uh, throughout this small, uh, this loop here. Uh, chart for recommended water velocity is pretty sure everybody's seen this. Uh, for this situation or this pipe main here, we're looking at uh, mains and risers. They have a range of three to 10 feet per second. Uh, so a bunch of places where they picked it right in the middle of design your systems at six uh, feet, uh, feet per second. And then just want to point out that with uh, any um, chill water or hot water hydronic system, your systems to me are almost always exclusively variable flow. Uh, you know, they save energy, uh, not that hard to control. A lot of times they're required per coat if they're above a certain horsepower. And so because that main pump does have a VFD, you'll size your, your pipe mains for worst case scenario, but you do have full flow, but will actually happen uh, depending on your system and your diversity and such like that, that your, uh, you know, water flow is going to be, you know, 50 to 80% of the uh, design flow from anywhere from you know 75 to 95 percent of the time. Once again, uh, nothing nothing new that uh, everybody doesn't kind of already know already. Uh, Going to date myself, but just uh, here is an old uh, chart that shows uh, just how to size piping. Uh, you know, you'll you'll size it based on your water flow, uh, the pipe size, and then your velocity as well as your uh, friction loss. They have these dip. They have different ones for open versus closed, copper versus steel. Uh, also different uh, schedule or thicknesses of the water. Um, you know, handy dandy uh, PNG system size, sizer. Um, you know, once again, dating myself would probably believe that all this is already done or just done via uh, computer systems, et cetera, like that. You know, some maybe some Excel or type of <laughs> spreadsheet. All right, 
So with pipe size versus velocity, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of times you're always trying to balance uh, first class versus uh, operations. So uh, this uh, graph here just has pipe sizes on the left. The purple, uh, um, the purple graph or purple line shows as you re reduce your pipe size, you're going to uh, reduce your first cost. But then the uh, velocity uh, or your water flow will, uh, velocity of the water flow will increase, which is following your yellow line. So once again, you're trying to find a happy medium between uh, you know, where they intersect and just realize that the higher that you have your piping velocity, that translates to a higher pressure drop. So a higher pressure drop uh, you know, has, causes higher operating costs. You'll get a little bit more erosion of the interior pipe with the higher velocity. And then potentially you could have a problem with uh, noise. Uh, noise is oftentimes uh, a result of, um, of uh, uh, you know, air bubbles inside your system, uh, you know, sounds like rocks when it goes through it. So a higher velocity, once again, uh, could make your system noisier. Some examples of a single pipe piping uh, system. So here we have just a chiller in the center with your main trunk, and then we have two loops, uh, loop number one, loop number two feeding individual um, uh, terminal units. An example that um, you know, Climate Master has is a Love's Travel Stop. Uh, everybody's seen these, you know, there's one I know in South, kind of in South Jersey or near South Jersey, in South Jersey where I used to live. This one here was done for a um, travel stop, obviously, but this was a water source heat pump uh, trying to show in the center, just they have the main piping loop and then they had branch run out to each of these little red uh, rectangles. These little red rectangles were uh, water source heat pumps. And then just uh, blow up of the uh, piping detail, just realize, you know, once again, with single pipe or two pipe or four pipe, you still have to provide an expansion loop uh, if you have a long um, pipe length. And then just looking at the detail uh, in the mechanical room, this is a uh, elevation view where you, on the upper left, you have your uh, pipes traveling to your building. This one here used a uh, geothermal well field out on the bottom. And then just you have your, uh, you know, once again, whether it's a single pipe or other two or four pipe systems, you have to be concerned about uh, air removal, um, which is done with this air separator here, uh, volume expansion with your expansion tank uh, on the floor here. And then once again, this is showing as main and standby uh, for the uh, pumping system. Other uh, routing examples uh, often used in uh, dormitories, uh, high rises, et cetera, like that, is where you would have a, a, a riser going to uh, multiple floors. And then on each of the floors, you would have a, a horizontal loop to feed your terminal units. You can have, once again, multiple risers. An example of a project that, uh, that uh, IEC did was uh, down in North Carolina, Greensboro. They built a new residence hall that was nine stories tall. They compared a, a single pipe versus a two pipe system. These were using uh, fan coil units. So they had their piping mains run in the, um, in the hallway. And then you can see the fan coil units uh, were close to the uh, hallway. They built a little soffit and then had these as a side blow uh, into, the, um, into, the, uh, into the rooms, the, the students' uh, dorm rooms. Um, so they had, this was a nine story building, so they had multiple pipe risers and then each floor had a, a multiple uh, loops. They calculated that with the single pipe system versus a two pipe, they saved over 5,000 pipe, 5,000 feet of pipe, as well as many fittings and as well as uh, all that insulation. And then they estimated that the cost to the contract is they saved $350,000. Other routing examples, just uh, alternate, whether you have, uh, you know, multiple risers uh, with, uh, uh, you know, um, with a horizontal feeding uh, one side of the hall or, or feeding, you know, two sides of the hall, a lot of flexibility with this system. And then these are also available, you know, could be used for multi-campus, um, you know, system with uh, uh, multiple buildings. So let's talk about the uh, equipment and loop sizing. First, we'll talk about a chill water. First, we're gonna look at the main. This is the, uh, the one that I uh, mentioned, <coughs> excuse me, before. 
um, the mains you have to account <clears throat> for uh, diversity on the loop, but you're going to size each fan coil for um, for the space load. And then as you, as I shown before, as you travel down the loop from multiple fan coils, what will happen is your uh, chill water temperature at the end of the loop will be higher than at the beginning. So what you'll have to do is account for this by uh, increasing your chill water coil, maybe from a three row to a four row, or maybe just increase your fan coil size from a two to a, th a three, a size two to a three. Each of those changes there are not really that uh, expensive. And then typically with a chill water system, you design for 10 degrees, but with a single, single pipe, you're gonna kind of overflow the system. So you're gonna design with a eight degree delta T. For the runouts to each of the terminal units, uh, for chill water, just really, you know, basically for all these systems, you want to have a, the maximum length of the, uh, you know, fan coil of the terminal unit about 15 feet away from the main. You know, that means 30 feet total. A typical pipe size is three quarter to use instead of a, a half inch. And then just a rule of thumb for chill water is that you have a maximum of about uh, eight or 12 fan coils for each of the uh, loops. Now, want to look at the end of the chill water loop where you have that warmer uh, chill water temperature versus where you started. You have to be careful of two things. Uh, really, the most important thing is at that last uh, fan coil unit, you want to have a maximum entering water temperature of about 50 or 51 degrees. And then uh, subsequently, what will happen is at the end of the loop, you'll have a maximum you know, water temperature of about 52 degrees. Now, why is it so important to uh, have the, the maximum uh, temperature at the end of the loop about 50 or 51 degrees? So at this point here, what we're concerned about is dehumidification control in the space. So your space uh, on average is at 75 degrees dry bulb, 50% RH. Um, you have a, a dew point or a, a dew point temperature of about 55. So what will happen is if you're uh, entering wa chill water temperature is too warm, you're not going to be able to get enough cooling capacity uh, out of that um, uh, fan coil to properly, you know, cool and dry your air down to, you know, approximately 57 or 55 or 52 degrees. So what you'll end up doing is sort of like, you know, uh, playing or, you know, back and forth, you know, do this or do that. Uh, if you consider maybe lowering your uh, main or chill water loop temperature, you know, say maybe from 44 down to 42 or 42 down to 40, but then the opposite of what will happen is that's going to make your chiller uh, work harder, uh, maybe have to provide a 110 ton chiller versus a 100 ton chiller. And the other way you can, uh, you know, reduce the loop temperature is by putting, you know, obviously less fan coils on the loop. But if you do that, you're going to increase your uh, piping cost because you're going to have to run uh, more piping. Another thing to consider um, is, you know, why not uh, use a, de a dedicated outsider system? And then instead of providing neutral air, we'll pipe space latent load offset. So just, uh, you know, diverge or just a little bit from your single piping system. So you have a uh, your zone cooling load is uh, consists of two points. You have your outside air and space, uh, and then each of those uh, loads consists of latent cooling as well as sensible cooling. Everybody's familiar with the dedicated outside air system uh, shown here on the upper right. This is a dedicated outside air system that feeds outside air directly to each of the fan coil units. Uh, the benefits of a dedicated outside air system is you can uh, decouple the outside air versus your space load. You can uh, you know, uh, really uh, remove the moisture from your uh, system. You'll satisfy your um, uh, energy codes, your IEQ codes. There's a lot of flexibility for equipment, uh, easy to incorporate energy recovery wheel, um, you know, as shown there. If you do have a DX system, uh, hot gas reheat is uh, put on almost all the units. And then just um, you can, with the outside air unit, have, uh, you know, UV lights or, um, you know, air ionization for better, better indoor air quality. And then, you know, typically the fan coil and um, water source heat pump units uh, in terms of a MERV rating, 
it can get eight or you know sometimes 13, but the dedicated outside air unit uh, can handle that without any problems. So space latent load offset that I mentioned is what we're gonna do is take our dedicated outside air system and we're gonna provide uh, drier supply air off of it. Uh, we're gonna provide air that has a lower dew point temperature that's when the space. So if we look at a site chart, we have our outside air at uh, one condition, and then if our space is at 75 or 50%, so if we were gonna provide neutral air at point two, our dew point temperature would be about 55 degrees. What we're gonna do with space latent load offset, instead of 55 degrees, we're gonna provide 53 or 50, something lower. Uh, it's gonna be less than our 55 degree uh, dew point. What will happen is that drier uh, supply air that's been delivered to the space is going to end up uh, satisfying or taking care of uh, some of the or almost all of the space latent cooling load. What will happen is we'll have, uh, you know, this will enable us to go back to our, our warmer chill water temperatures, as well as maybe providing a smaller unit or not having to provide four rows versus three, et cetera, like that. All right, so uh, that was for uh, space latent load offset. Let's talk about hot water. Um, hot water, obviously you're using a boiler. Typically your temperatures, uh, loop temperatures have a 20 degree delta T, whether it's 180 down to 160, or maybe you have a condensing boiler from 140 down to 120. Just with the hot water systems, because you don't have dehumidification concerns, the uh, sizing of the units are not as critical. Uh, oftentimes the uh, load can be satisfied with just one row coil. A lot of times you'll have internal loads for light and people, et cetera, like that. But essentially what you'll do is you'll just follow the same pipe routing as your chill water loop instead of trying to uh, you know, make it different with uh, you know, 15 units on it versus uh, 10 or eight with the chill water system. Next, condenser water. Condenser water uh, systems for single pipe really lend itself well to um, single pipe systems. Typically, you have condenser water with a 10 degree delta T. Uh, cooling is in the 85 to 95 degree range. Heating can be 60 to 70. Uh, if you had maybe a geothermal loop, maybe your heating uh, temperatures and cooling temperatures are lower. Um, once again, similar to the hot water system, because your water source heat pumps have our, uh, are using that coaxial cable uh, and then they have a separate refrigeration loop, you have a lot of performance flexibility. As an example, um, I took a two ton unit and I ran it at different condenser water temperatures. So at 85 degrees, you had uh, you know, two tons of cooling output, uh, raise it up to 95 with just a little bit less. And then even if you allow the water temperature to rise you know, to this last um, heat pump here, at 100 degrees, you would still get um, you know, pretty close to two tons of cooling out of it. All right, so with the, the condenser water loop, um, as I mentioned, uh, uh, you know, the strength of the water source heat pumps make these very attractive. And then in addition with this performance flexibility, you can typically put on uh, additional um, uh, units on your uh, loop. All right, <clears throat> next couple of slides, let me just talk about, um, you know, what's new with uh, HCNI for the uh, past couple months. Um, we, uh, you know, back in November, um, we had a, uh, we merged with Gilbar. This is a repeat slide, you know, since the uh, new year <laughs> that I've uh, talked about. Um, just uh, we're recent changes, we're now the uh, ABB uh, rep for uh, variable frequency drives. These are low voltage ones with uh, you know, 460 and 208 slash 230. We have available the general purpose ones, also the micro um, ABB um, obviously does have uh, industrial drives for machinery, uh, industry, industry specific. Uh, just a quick uh, uh, summary, um, just, uh, you know, ABB has been making drives, I think since 1993. Um, in 2019, they introduced uh, the next gen. It's their fourth uh, generation drive. It's the model ACH580. And then what they've incorporated is uh, low, ultra low harmonics uh, versus a traditional drive. Um, that maybe a traditional drive, you would have to use a uh, line reactor or a, um, a choke, et cetera, like that. And then ABB uh, does have standard drives, but then they also have a customizable division. Uh, this customizable division is, uh, you know, growing in size, obviously, 
Um, you have, uh, you know, the implementation of, uh, you know, fan walls, fan arrays. Uh, you know, there's a, 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 an Aon unit shown there with 12. Maybe there's uh, two or three, but you can have a single point power, uh, a control slash uh, power panel. Um, you can incorporate uh, electric heaters into that uh, panel, um, have, uh, you know, circuit breakers. They have some customizability uh, with uh, full redundancy instead of putting a, a bypass uh, controls, et cetera, like that. Other recent changes that uh, affect me um, a little bit more uh, personally, I'll show you in the next slide, <laughs> is that um, HCNI, along with uh, Gilbar, um, were uh, part of a, a larger company called Ambient. Um, don't know much about all this yet. But essentially, we have three uh, divisions for product sales, um, healthcare solutions, as well as service professionals. Uh, right now, we're, our territory is from Delaware up to uh, Maine. <laughs> uh, you can see on the upper right there. You know, uh, assume pretty, I, assume pretty, <laughs> I assume pretty soon it's going to be uh, for Connecticut <laughs> and uh, Vermont. But uh, you know, how big is Vermont anyway? <laughs> Just joking. <laughs> All right, but uh, more personally, what's uh, going to change uh, with me is that, um, you know, part of my job is uh, uh, calling on engineers, customers, et cetera, like, as, as, et cetera, as well as doing these uh, webinars and educational pieces. So what Ambient is going to do is they're in the process of setting up an Ambient Academy. Uh, what we'll do is we'll have... Um, Classes for, uh, you know, design classes similar to this for engineers building owners. They're planning on having uh, classes for uh, contractors as well as installers. Um, they'll have classes for service and maintenance personnel. Uh, just uh, talking about, um, you know, uh, ABB uh, having, uh, you know, once a month or once every quarter uh, uh, service classes. We'll, we'll have uh, technicians come into our conference room, our training center here, and then we'll actually bring uh, BFDs uh, for, for a demo that they can work on, et cetera, like that. The intent of these classes are to have them online and uh, in person. Uh, just we've just uh, you know, started this whole endeavor you know, probably three weeks ago, et cetera, like that. And then just what I kind of see or envisioning happening is that these uh, presentations that I've been providing are you know, qualified for PDH, um, but these are not uh, qualified as PDH credits in New York State. Um, learning more about uh, PI or the Practicing Institute of Engineering, um, you know, what we'll have to do you know, internally is, is get these presentations approved uh, beforehand by this uh, third party, um, you know, certif certifying accreditation uh, entity. In terms of uh, equipment that we have available for single pipe, uh, the main product that's uh, used uh, very, very often is uh, IEC, uh, fan coil units made out in Oklahoma City, uh, industry leader, been around for a long time. Uh, there's a uh, uh, picture of all the different types they have available. Uh, low boys, they have vertical ones that are concealed or exposed, uh, similar for horizontal. The horizontal and vertical, they also have, um, you know, larger ones. And then shown in the back are vertical stacks, um, you know, vertical stacks that are used on, you know, high rises where you have your pipe mains uh, lined up. And these, um, you know, in a hotel room or dorms or, or condos, et cetera, like that. Um, you know, on the uh, outside wall, you know, uh, hidden. And then just um, IEC does have, uh, you know, different types of piping packages av available, um, as well as, uh, you know, controls and thermostats. Controls are simple, um, you know, terminal strips all the way up to, uh, you know, DDC controllers, um, uh, back net, et cetera, like that. So IEC uh, in 2000, they created a, uh, a single pipe system called SureFlow. Um, so from the factory, they'll ship out the um, unit uh, with the piping package um, factory installed. You can see it on a little bit on the right there. 
um, what they have, um, you know, uh, available, you know, is, um, you know, some design tools that I'll show you next, but they have, um, these systems have been installed, uh, you know, over the past, you know, 20 plus years, you're probably, that 15,000 is probably uh, closer to 20, um, you know, from the uh, time of the, uh, the slide that I took it from. And then the other thing you have to find out more about is just recently found out that in downtown Philly, there's a Hotel Monaco, which we uh, believe is still there. And they had a single pipe system put back in, in, in 2012. So we're trying to track down uh, information about that. You know, probably going to have to, you know, uh, make take a ride and go down and try to do some digging <laughs> uh, uh, down that way as well. So the free design assistance that uh, IEC has with the single pipe system is they have a 94-page uh, technical guide that goes through a lot of the uh, details that I just summarized here quickly today. Um, and then in addition, which is very helpful, is that they have uh, computer software where they can, uh, you can simulate um, each of the loops. So this loop here has, you know, 10 different fan coils on it. You can input your temperatures, you can input your capacities, and then the program automatically calculates the uh, mixed water temperature and then automatically calculates the uh, performance of the units, you know, uh, downstream or, you know, on the on the piping loop. Uh, you know, a little bit tough, tough to use at first, but once you get the hang of it, it's not really too bad. Um, helps you a lot versus going back and forth with uh, selecting, um, you know, uh, one, one unit here and then adjusting this, uh, you know, downstream, et cetera, like that. Also along uh, chillers for chill water, um, we have uh, Climacool. <laughs> These are made out in Oklahoma City. On the left is shown a water-cooled one. On the right is a uh, air-cooled. These can be, you know, stacked next to each other um, with, uh, you know, uh, piping uh, manifolds, uh, you know, kind of shown a little bit in the black there. Um, these are also available with, uh, you know, specialty systems. When I say specialty systems, uh, referring to um, water source heat pump, uh, heat recovery, simultaneously heating and cooling. Um, what the modular chillers offer is redundancy, um, ease of uh, future expansions. And then if you do have, say, a large like 500 ton chiller that was put in, you know, 25 years ago and they built the building around it, um, that chiller would have to be, you know, cut up. Uh, you know, the existing chiller is gonna have to be cut into pieces to come out. And then uh, the new um, uh, uh, chiller could be these modular ones that fit through a door, um, make it a lot easier, um, you know, for a replacement uh, project. We also have Quantec. Quantec uh, makes uh, air-cooled and water-cooled chillers from these tonnages. These are available with scroll as well as uh, screw compressors. Next is water source heat pumps. Uh, this is Climate Master, once again, out in Oklahoma City. These have been around for over 50 years. Uh, Climate Master, similar to IEC, has all the different types of uh, water source heat pumps available. Uh, the ones that we see with the single pipe uh, you know, shown in that Love's Travel Stop was uh, horizontal ones above the ceiling. Once again, similar to IEC, they have all the different types of uh, DDC controls as well as uh, thermostats, uh, backnet cards, uh, controllers, et cetera, like that. Also, uh, just realize that with, with chill water systems, you do have chill beams uh, available. Uh, we represent Semco. Semco makes active as well as passive types. Um, there's multiple different styles there. Um, you know, four-way blow in the upper uh, center, uh, two-way in the lower left, and then in the center is like a hotel one where it would be put in a soffit, like say over by the door, you would have your return air um, enter in the uh, bottom and then discharge out the side. And the other interesting thing that Semco has is they have a uh, Newton uh, controlled uh, pump module where they're providing active condensate control. Um, this one here shown, there's a the, the gray uh, panel in the center. You have your circulating pump that feeds out to your chill beam systems. 
And then on the inlet, you have your uh, control valves that are uh, using uh, chill water or hot water. Um, you know, these uh, systems end up reducing first cost by reducing piping, uh, make it easier for controlling. Uh, and then these uh, units are factory built and they do have plug and play controls. Um, in this case, you can put up to 15 or 20 beams on a single pump. Uh, Semco does have technical resources available to help uh, us salespeople and our customers with the design of that. And then lastly, um, you know, these aren't just for two pipe or four pipe systems. These can be used for single pipe systems as well. All right, so in a summary, uh, what I went over today is single pipe hydronic systems. They can be used for chill water, hot water, as well as condenser water systems with water source heat pumps. These have uh, much lower, significantly lower first cost. That is probably the biggest selling point for these systems. But just because you're uh, uh, not spending as much money, you're still providing the same occupancy comfort as a two or four pipe uh, system. There's um, you know, uh, many design tools available to assist you. I, I feel like it's the same process as you have for a two pipe and four pipe system with your you know, being careful of your hookups, being careful of your controls, being accounting for your sizing with diversity, et cetera, like that. But just with the, the, um, with the single pipe systems, the other, uh, you didn't, shouldn't say it's a burden, but the other thing that happens is that your uh, supply and return water are mixing. So you have to account for that warmer uh, mixing water temperatures. Usually on hot water and condenser water systems, there's a lot of flexibility, that's not an issue. But you definitely want to be careful on a chill water uh, system for cooling. You have to account for dehumidification concerns. And then lastly, just talked about, um, you know, probably the next seminar that we'll do will be uh, on ABB. Uh, still in the process of figuring out what added Ambient Academy is going to be uh, doing uh, between, um, you know, myself, uh, a similar uh, person that I'm in <laughs> up in uh, Boston, as well as New York City and North Jersey. All right, so just in summary, uh, you know, please, if you can uh, complete the survey, we do appreciate that. Um, 1.0 PDH uh, credits are available. Uh, Gianna told me to tell people that they'll be automatically sent out later today. Uh, just, you know, if you've already requested them, she already has them done, but uh, feel free to, um, you know, email myself or Gianna and we'll get those out to you. Uh, upcoming uh, with Ambient Academy, uh, it's kind of in flux now, but I'm hoping to do um, another webinar uh, in June, you know, before the summer comes, before people start vacationing, uh, before they start vacationing because their kids have out of school, was looking at probably Tuesday the 13th. And then just with, um, you know, as a new ABB rep, um, I sort of get the feeling that, um, you know, a, a VFDs are used like almost in every single application for uh, airflow, for uh, fluid, et cetera, like that. But maybe, um, you know, they've, uh, you know, maybe we can go into more details about uh, concerns with uh, harmonics and uh, controls and what the actual VFD, how it operates and set it like that, all right? So that's uh, my presentation, a little bit uh, you know, quick today. So let me uh, transition to see the, uh, the questions here. Okay, the first question is from uh, John. So does IEC uh, have the one pipe piping package? Um, that is a yes. So um, let me just, I have a poor, apologize, John, I have sort of a poor, a poor picture that maybe I should have blown up some more. <laughs> but um, they do have um, available, um, you know, this piping package on a bunch of different uh, fan call units. And the piping package uh, includes, uh, you know, the isolation valves as well as the pumps. Uh, this can be uh, for a, um, a cooling system, it could be for a two pipe system, a, a two coil system, I'll call it. 
where you have your hot water and chill water on the same um, loop uh, can also be, you know, the, the, pic the other picture that I showed had, um, you know, single pipe piping system for a chill water as well as hot water um, uh, system. Ah, good question, John. So for, for one pipe cooling in a chill water system, how do you address the 15 degree delta T requirements of ASHRAE standard 90.1 later additions? Um, yeah, that's a good question, John. I'll probably have to go back to the factory. Um, just any um, chill water system designs that I've seen um, have been traditionally uh, 50, 44 leaving and 54, you know, uh, return that uh, you know follows like A ARI uh, conditions have seen um, uh, you know have seen that for uh, you know 44 uh, sorry 42 up to 54 so I'll have to um, uh, check with IEC for help on that one because I'm not familiar with uh, chill water being a 15 degree delta T Okay, Travis, uh, very well done presentation. Thank you. <laughs> I would never consider a single pipe, but with DOAS units being so common now, it makes a lot of sense, especially for multifamily developer projects, which is moderately big market. Okay, <laughs> sounds good. Thank you, Travis. <laughs> okay, and then the uh, Travis is also commenting that the uh, the the ASHRAE requirement or the the energy code requirement of a 15 degree delta T is only on um, hot water systems. And, um, you know, as, as my slide or what I've seen most of the time mentioned uh, or used as a 20 degree delta T with 180 down to 160, uh, very rarely every once in a while, I'll see like 30 or even uh, some cases as 140. Um, always felt that, uh, you know, 140 is great from a uh, pumping perspective that you have such a high, Delta T and therefore a low uh, GPM. But then the other thing you have to be concerned about is that return water temperature. Um, if my recollection is correct, uh, 140 degrees for uh, hot water systems is right on the threshold of a uh, condensing boiler or non condensing. So, um, you know, if you have a condensing boiler, 140 to 100. Um, probably can still get enough uh, heating out of your piping system. Maybe you have to go from a one row to a, a two row coil. Um, the other you know, side would be, okay, if you're at 180 degrees down to 140 or 200 degrees down to 160, you know, 200 degree hot water is, uh, you know, it's very hot. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, provides a lot of uh, heat. Um, you know, close obviously to, uh, you know, steam temperatures. And I've always felt that uh, steam is, is difficult, to, difficult to control for HVAC systems because your steam temperature is 210 and 220 degrees. Uh, meanwhile, you're looking to heat the air, from, you know, 40 degrees up to a leaving of 70 or really a leaving of 95. So there's just a humongous uh, delta T between steam, the air, the, water, the, the steam temperature versus your air temperature. All right, I'll stay on the line for a, uh, a little bit more. You know, thank you all for attending. Um, you know, we'll send out a summary. Uh, we'll have a link to the recording. We'll have a, uh, you know, summarize the question and answers. And then once again, we can provide um, a PDA certificate. Travis, you're welcome. <laughs> thank you for attending. Mark, thank you. Thanks for attending. I appreciate it, guys. <laughs> Malcolm, thank you.
<laughs> Hello? Yes, Michael, sorry, I have you uh, unmuted. You had a, a raise your hand, you had a question? Yes, my question is, did, uh, do you do anything with uh, retrofitting induction units? Um, I've got a hospital that has 62 induction units. They have us replacing the air handler. And I know that they're going to ask for uh, upgrading the induction units. And uh, they have, uh, you know, the one pipe system where they switch over from chill water to hot water in the in the season. Yeah. And um, I'm wondering if it's possible with the one pipe system to possibly go to a two pipe system more economically than we used to. Uh, you know what I mean? In, in other words, a separate right. system, because there's always these complaints in hospitals about uh, uh, one room want, needs heat and the other room needs cooling. And there's a lot of friction about that in the, in the shelter right. season. Right. Yeah. So if you had a two pipe system, um, you know, you have chill water, but then a lot of times they'll, they could add like electric heat, um, you know, so you can sort of you know temper that or for a little <laughs> a little bit part of the time um but that's a good question about um you know induction systems are obviously hydronic um i'd have to you know i know how they work i used to work a carrier and um you know they beat us into the head how somebody a carrier uh, invented them <laughs> yes, but, um, they did yes <laughs> you know so, you know, and, and when I, you know, I, so I started with Carrie in 2000. So a lot of, um, a lot of, not a lot, but I re would get requests <clears throat> for replacement induction units, replacement controls for it. But as the years went on, those uh, really, you know, they, there weren't that many to begin with, but then you weren't getting any of them. So, but I, I do know that some manufacturers still make induction units um, what they've uh, done or improved upon is that the old induction units required like one inch of uh, static pressure to them because of the nozzle or the manifold or the, the design. So they have greatly reduced uh, those requirements. Yeah, so so, I uh, found a company that 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 does that, and they also okay they. they they wind up having two coils and they'll retrofit a, a carrier unit. You leave the same casing in and they'll ah, put the two coils in. Right. Uh, so, but I'm wondering how major the piping change would be there. I have to look at the system more, but it's, uh, but I, right. I might like to talk to you about that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You'd have to look at like the routing, you know, where the risers come up, et cetera, like that. So, okay. Yep. Great. Yeah. We'll, you know, send, you know, you can email me and, um, you know, we'll get you, you know, if, you know, we'll get you to the right HCNI salesperson. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for attending. Thanks for the, the, uh, the question or, you know, very interesting, uh, to, uh <laughs> topic <laughs> or, or application rather. <laughs> Thank you. This has been a helpful webinar. Thank you very much. Okay. You're welcome. Thanks for attending. I'm going to put you on mute and then. Oh, <laughs> how I get these to work. <laughs> All righty, Travis, can you hear me? <laughs> Oh God, this thing keeps on switching back and forth. Come on, there you go. Travis, I apologize. I should know how to do this. There you go. Maybe you can hear me now.
Travis, can you, is this, is this working? Travis, why don't you uh, give me a call? I apologize that I can't figure out how to get you uh, unmuted. We've done, you know, done ten or fifteen of these, and this is the <laughs> this is the first request or time that came in for uh, a uh, a hand raise. All righty. Alrighty, everybody, um, 12.58, um, you know, uh, thank you for attending. I'll stay on for another minute or so. Uh, if any other questions pop up, if uh, you do have any questions, you can always free to uh, email me. And as you know, I'll go to switch to this beginning. Here's my contact information that you all should have. All right, everybody. Okay. Have a good day. Thanks once again for attending. Really appreciate it. Have a good one.